Okay, welcome to the lecture this, uh, this morning on uh, gold standards, true and false. Uh, usually, um, since World War II, and especially um, since the 1970s, every time we had a, a crisis of some sort, a monetary crisis, there, there have gone up from various people um, calls for return to the gold standard, especially since the collapse of the Bretton Woods standard, which was falsely believed to have been a gold standard. And lately, uh, there are a number of what I would call neo-supply-siders, uh, people who um, thought that the, the, the Reagan era was um, great in terms of economic performance. Uh, so these people have uh, gotten behind a bill that has been introduced at the House of Representatives. It was introduced last year, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But it's a bill purportedly to reestablish the gold standard. But what I want to show you today is that there are gold standards and there are gold standards. Okay, some gold standards are false gold standards, others are genuine. And so what I want to do is to give you an idea of how to distinguish between different kinds of gold standards. We'll go through a true gold standard in history, and then a historical gold standard that was a false gold standard, and then talk a little bit more about this bill which was introduced by Representative Ted Poe, a Republican. So if you've studied international economics, you've um, been told that a gold standard is a fixed exchange rate standard. And that um, in, in distinction to that, you have uh, other types of, of flexible exchange rate standards. So the defining characteristic of a gold standard is supposed to be the fact that it's fixed exchange rates. That is that all the currencies on the gold standard are fixed, um, their exchange rates are fixed in terms of the, of the other foreign currencies and of gold. But I want to show you that's really uh, a, an incorrect approach to um, looking at the international monetary system and the different types of monetary arrangements you could have under that system. Okay, so this is more of an Austrian-oriented approach to um, analyzing international uh, monetary systems. So all the way on the left, if you can see there, we have the market supplied commodity money, okay? That is the distinguishing characteristic of the gold standard. It's supplied by the market. The supply of gold in circulation, or the supply of money in circulation, the money supply, is determined ultimately by um, the production of gold in the economy and the, and the amount of gold that exists at any moment. So we have the original money that arose on the market was always a commodity standard. We've had a 100% gold standard for centuries, okay? Um, gold, silver, going back even further, copper, brass, leather in Roman times. Um, in, in the lecture on money, you should have been uh, acquainted with these different types of commodity standards. But eventually, silver and gold arose as the best qualified metals or um, items to, to serve as money. Okay. Uh, then we got a, a gold standard in which the government interfered to a, a greater or lesser extent, but it was still a genuine gold standard. That's the gold standard I will talk about today as a genuine gold standard, okay? That's a classical gold standard. So as you go from left to right, you go from the best systems to the worst systems, okay? Um, what I'm gonna do is to talk about one of these bad systems, a false gold standard, one of which is the Bretton Woods system, um, which actually was formulated in 1944, though it was put into operation in 1946. So we're um, celebrating, the, or not celebrating, but um, we're uh, marking the 100th anniversary of, of the Bretton Woods system. So I will say some words about that. It's a false system, okay? But the key here is that all the systems to the right are government-monopolized fiat money. They're based on government-monopolized fiat money. Um, there's even the, the Keynesian ideal, which is uh, fiat reserves created by a world central bank. Okay, that's what the, the, uh, Keynes himself would have liked to have seen. Okay, um, and Keynesians every once in a while come back with this idea. Okay, so what's interesting is in the neoclassical treatment of different kinds of monetary systems, they since this is a fixed exchange rate system, all the currencies are based on one world fiat currency. And this is a so-called fixed exchange rate system, since everyone, all countries use gold. Uh, you have the best and the worst combined uh, or, or put together under one category in the standard treatment, whereas you can see they're polar opposites 
um, according to Austrians, okay? Because here, the production of money is completely controlled by market forces. Here, it's completely controlled by uh, a unified political body, okay? So let's talk about the classical gold standard, which I, I said had some government interference. Um, according to the classical gold standard, uh, or under the glass, classical gold standard, monetary unit is defined as a weight of gold. Okay, gold and nothing else serves as money. Okay. Um, bank notes and deposits, to the extent that they exist, and they can certainly exist, under a 100% gold standard or even under a, uh, under a classical gold standard especially, um, they're instantaneously redeemable, or redeemable on demand for gold or silver. So when I, I, I say gold, I mean gold or silver or, or any other type of commodity that the market has chosen as money. Okay? And so uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, but in addition to those banknotes and deposits, under genuine gold standards, gold coin is actually in circulation, as it was during the 19th century, uh, the period of the classical gold standard. Um, the the uh, dep uh, deposits and banknotes, because the, uh, under the classical gold standard, uh, individual banks, private banks, could issue not only their own checking deposits, but also their own banknotes. And we'll see that uh, examples of that in a moment. Okay? And also, a central bank may or may not exist. Um, it did not exist in the US, a central bank, under the classical gold standard until 1914, which was the beginning of the end for it. But it did exist in Great Britain and, and, and France. Great Britain since 19, uh, 1692 was, was, was when the Bank of England came into existence as a quasi um, uh, central bank. So um, it may or may not exist, but it doesn't interfere with the, the, the market supplying gold as the ultimate money. Okay, so what is the monetary unit under the gold standard? Okay, so let's take both the US and Great Britain. Um, in the US, you had from 1834 to 1933, about 100 years, um, you had the legal or, or the dollar legally defined as 1 20th of an ounce of gold, more precisely as 23.22 grains of gold. The British pound, um, from the time when they went back onto the gold standard after the Napoleonic Wars in 1821 until 1931, uh, was legally defined as one quarter of an ounce of gold, approximately, okay, or 113 grains of gold, okay. The French franc was defined as one hundredth of an ounce of gold, and so on, okay. So, there weren't three distinct monies in the U.S., France, and Great Britain during that time. There's only one money. It was gold, okay. Dollars, pounds, francs were just names for different weights of gold, just like nickels, quarters, dimes are names for different fractions of a dollar. So gold is not a fixed exchange rate system, okay? Because look, um, it's simply the law of arithmetic. Uh, if the, the dollar uh, um, pound exchange rate for 100 years was $4.86 um, plus or minus 1%, um, and the reason why was because 113 grains of gold, which was the definition of the pound, contained five times the amount of gold approximately as, as, as the dollar did, which was defined as 23.22 ounces. So, you had to give $5 for one pound precisely because that, those um, uh, quantities represented the same amount of gold. In the same way, we don't say there's fixed exchange rates between nickels and quarters in the US monetary system today. A nickel is defined as a 20th of a dollar, a quarter is defined as one quarter of a dollar, therefore, five nickels exchange, they don't exchange, they're equal to a quarter, okay? That's an arithmetical, Equality, it's not a fixed exchange rate. So, bottom line is that there weren't different quantities of gold, or there weren't different currencies under the gold standard, they were all the same currency, that is gold. So here um, are, are $20 pieces and $5 pieces uh, from 1921 to 1906 respectively, okay? And here's, here are, are British sovereigns, okay? So it, it didn't matter whether you actually had um, dollars in, in, in Great Britain, or you carried sovereigns into the United States. As long as the, uh, the seller who was accepting your gold was convinced or was confident that it wasn't counterfeit, it would be, they would be accepted. Okay? You didn't have to change money to go from one country to the next. You could just carry gold. What was important to the seller was what? The weight of gold that he or she was receiving in exchange for the goods that they sold you. 
So uh, bank notes and government issued notes did exist, as I said, under the gold standard, but they were not money proper. They were substitutes for money. They substituted in exchange for money that was held in the bank vaults or in the government treasury. Okay. They were part of the money supply, but only because they represented a certain quantity of gold. Um, and in fact, you can see that on these notes, which were uh, privately issued notes. In 1903, this is a claim for $20. Notice what it says here. It's from a private bank, the Farmers and Merchants National Bank of Los Angeles. It says, we'll pay to the bearer on demand $20. Does it say that that's $20? That's not $20. That's a claim to $20. $20 is one ounce of gold. Okay, so it's a claim to money. It isn't money per se. And just the same thing here. Um, the First National Bank of Fort Myers in Florida will pay to the bearer on demand $5. It doesn't say this is $5. Simply a claim. Okay, just like the claim to your laundry or the, or the claim to a suit that you've dropped off to be dry cleaned is not the suit itself. Okay? It has the exact same value as the suit. You can sell it to someone else who has already seen your suit maybe and, wants to buy, and allow him to pick it up if you could sign it over to him. All right? It's simply the claim. Now, the value of that note was precisely $5 to the extent that people had confident, confidence that it was an immediately redeemable claim to gold. Okay? Once they lost confidence, the value of that note would either go to zero if the bank collapsed, or it would go to a discount if there was a probability that the bank wouldn't pay off. It would only circulate at $3 or, or, or $4.50. So here's some of the principles of operation, okay? So as I pointed out, no fixed exchange rate, just one money under the gold standard, okay? Which is supposedly the Keynesian dream. Well, it's right in, it was right in front of them or right behind them, okay? That's what we had in the 19th century. We had one world money. Though in the Far East, they used, they used silver more than gold. Um, so in redeeming $20 for one ounce of gold, the central bank or the government is not selling gold for dollars, because the monetarist economists, led by Milton Friedman, always claim that the, the um, gold standard is a price-fixing scheme, that the government sells, sells dollars for gold at a fixed price or sells gold for dollars at a fixed price to fix the price at $20 per ounce. That's not the case. They're simply fulfilling their contract. They've received some of your property, the bank, and in exchange, you receive a claim that to that which they are contractually obligated to um, honor as soon as you appear, okay? Uh, you're the bear bearer of that claim, and then they'll give you the gold. So that's not a price-fixing scheme. It's absurd to call it that, okay? You're not fixing the price of gold. Uh, in the long run, the money supply is strictly limited by gold mining, even on the classical gold standard, okay? It was, in the old days, it was called golden handcuffs, that the government had its hands in handcuffs, in a sense, that they couldn't expand the money supply beyond the, the amount of gold that was flowing into the country. Because if they did so, it would cause inflation and it would, would cause a loss of gold reserves and a loss of confidence as these gold reserves flowed out of the country in the banks and, and in, in, in the government treasury. Okay? And finally, um, prices tended to fall over time um, under the gold standard, because the production of the per, per, per a, a, the annual or per, per annum production of gold was very small compared to the amount of gold in existence and compared to the rate of growth in, in a vibrant capitalist economy of the amount of goods and services in the economy. So the amount of goods and services increased yearly at a, a, a more rapid rate than the amount of money in the economy, which meant that you had a fall in prices. This is supposedly fear, fear, greatly feared and dreaded deflation. Okay? But deflation was the natural outcome of a gold standard um, uh, operating uh, in a capitalist economy. Okay? So as you had more and more um, saving and investment, which went into producing more and better capital goods, as you had better technology, improvements in technology that were incorporated into these capital goods, you had greater and greater rates of growth of goods. Okay. So notice uh, that there was, a, there was a gentle price deflation throughout the 19th century, um, and especially from 1880, after the U.S. went back on the gold standard after the Civil War, um, until 1896, when new processes 
for extracting gold from low low grade ore came into being there was a, a, a an increase in the amount of gold produced from 1896 to 1914 but prior to that we had inflation of 30 percent during those 16, 16 years okay prices fell by 30 percent that meant that without doing anything without getting a raise you gained 30 percent in income okay and the value of, of, of your dollar was 30 percent greater but at the same time, that deflation, it didn't cause a depression. It didn't cause people to be thrown out of work. It didn't cause an increase in unemployment. Because notice, real GDP went up by 85% or 5% per year. Okay? Why? Because this is when the U.S. was rapidly transforming itself into a, a major industrial economy. So with the improvement in technology, with the tremendous increase in saving and investment after World War II, after, after the Civil War, excuse me, we had a tremendous growth in the amount of goods and services produced that outstripped the growth in the money supply during that period. And so, and so, so costs fell. The cost of different things fell. And it didn't cause these industries to go out of business. Just as, for example, um, if, in 1980, uh, you know, a, a computer, a personal computer may have cost $20,000. Um, prices have fallen by 35% per year um, between 1980 and 2000. Uh, and while in 1980 there were a half a million personal computers shipped, there were 11 million units in, two, in, in 2000 shipped. So as prices fell and costs fell, the industry didn't shrivel up because of deflation. Okay? What happened was that it, it flourished because of, of, of the, the in innovations and, and the um, um, fall in, in the cost of production. Here's a, uh, the, the price level from 1800 to 1900. So notice in 1800, it's right here at 150. By 1900, it's fallen 50%. So there was a downward trend in prices. Now notice the increases. When do you think those happened? Well, that, that increase in the price index occurred during the, the um, era of the first bank of the United States, the first quasi-central bank that we had, which printed paper money like crazy. The second increase occurred during the Civil War when we had gone off the gold standard. Okay, and then after we returned to the gold standard, we, we began to get the, the again the decline in prices. Okay, now prices rose a little bit from 1900 to to 1914, and people actually called it an inflation, um, but it was l less than one percent per year that prices rose, and that was as I said because it became more um, uh, technolog technologically feasible to extract gold from very low grade ore that used to be just thrown away when it was taken out of the mine. Okay, one of the key aspects of the gold standard is something called the price specie flow mechanism. Specie simply refers to the special metals, gold and silver, <laughs> uh, the precious metals, excuse me, gold and silver. Um, <laughs> Professor Herbener, if you were in his free trade and its enemies lecture, talked about um, the price specie flow mechanism, but I'll explain it. And it's what kept inflation in check under the gold standard. It was very effective was actually first discovered by um, a, an 18th century philosopher economist, which I think I mentioned in my first lecture. His name was David Hume. And um, that was, uh, Hume discovered it, but then it was, it, it was refined and elaborated. And um, probably the best um, statement of it was given uh, in 1937 in a book by F.A. Hayek, an Austrian. But in any case, what did it do? Well, it maintained equilibrium, BOP always stands for balance of payments, in the balance of payments. It made sure that there weren't huge surpluses or huge deficits that went on for years and years, okay? It distributed gold throughout the gold standard area according to the relative demands for money. If the U.S. was a bigger economy, for example, than, um, let's say, France or Italy, well, then the U.S. would get more of the, of the gold in the world because it, it, it had more goods that had to be bought and sold. It also operates interregionally between states and the U.S. For example, um, we know that uh, the Rust Belt, parts of the Midwest, have, have shrunk tremendously. Take Detroit. It's lost tremendous industry, uh, jobs, and so on. It doesn't need as much money to transact its business. So without any fanfare, the amount of dollars circulating in the Detroit area has shrunk. And some of these dollars have gone to an area where there's a greater demand for money, uh, let's say the um, Silicon Valley, okay? Does anyone know what the balance of payments of Detroit is or was? 
No, because fortunately, the, the government, we shouldn't care, first of all, bounce of payments don't matter. The government um, doesn't collect statistics on interstate trade, trade between the states, okay, and within the country. So we're fortunate, um, but, but, but uh, states all the, have uh, surpluses and deficits in their bounce of payments all the time. No one knows what they are, no one cares, it doesn't matter. The market in that area, in the dollar area, keeps the balance between the various states as they grow or decline. Whereas some states grow more than others, money will be shifted to those states that um, have an increase in the demand for money. Okay? And that's the way the gold standard operated on an international level. Okay? No one was really worried about the balance of payments. You never, it was, never became a problem until governments began interfering after World War I, or, uh, after 1914. Okay? So it limited uh, the increase in the money supply and inflation, that is the price specie flow mechanism, okay, by the central bank and the banking system. So let's look at what it is. Let's say the U.S. Um, banks increase the money supply, okay? And uh, what, what happens? Well, notice it causes, the, uh, the sideways arrow indicates cause, causation, causes prices, P sub U.S., to go up in the U.S. above or more than prices in the world. So now suddenly prices are higher in the U.S. than they are in the rest of the world. What's the natural um, effect of that? Well, X for exports, U.S. exports are going to become more expensive, and they're going to fall. And on the other hand, U.S. citizens are going to buy fewer domestic pr products and buy more foreign products. So imports are going to go up. We're suddenly going to have the dreaded balance of payments. Okay? So the balance of payments is now going to be negative. It's going to be less than zero, meaning more money is spent abroad than is being spent on our products. So the next step is that you'll get um, a deficit Okay, which is another way of saying that the balance of payments is negative. Um, and once that happens, gold will begin to flow out of the country because foreigners who have these excess dollars, they don't use dollars in their economy. Okay? Under the gold standard, they want gold. So when those dollars get turned into their, their banks, their banks are going to demand gold from the U.S. What's going to happen? Gold is going to begin to flow out of the U.S. As gold flows out of the U.S., the banks are going to have to reduce the money supply or stop increasing it. Okay. As they do that, as the U.S. money supply falls, then you're going to get U.S. prices again falling. Okay, and they're going to go back. They're going to go back uh, below uh, world prices, or at least uh, the rate at which they're rising. And eventually, they'll be equal to world prices. In which case, um, you're going to get U.S. exports picking up again, imports going down because now it is cheaper to buy in your country many goods, um, and then you'll get a balance of payment surplus, and the gold will flow back in. That was automatic. You'd have to worry about that happening. Okay? The only problem was if the banks continued to increase the U.S. money supply, it would continue to cause prices in the U.S. to rise more, more rapidly, and it would cause gold to flow out. Okay? So that's the, the, about, uh, the price species flow mechanism. So it is true under the classical gold standard because we didn't have 100% gold backing of the money substitutes. Of, of the notes and deposits, um, the banks could temporarily increase the money supply, and that would cause temporary inflationary boom, deficits, um, and eventually when the banks were forced by the outflow of gold, or, or, or in, in Britain's case, the, the, the central bank, uh, the Bank of England, was forced by the outflow of gold to stop increasing the money supply or continue to lose gold, uh, at that point then, the, um, a, there would be a recession. Okay. But these booms and busts were very minor compared to what occurred after 1914, after we left the gold standard. Okay, okay so here's the, the money pyramid under the classical gold standard. Note that, let's say the country has $2 billion in gold. Let's say the central bank has $2 billion in gold. And the central bank decides to keep a reserve ratio of 40%. They're only going to back up their notes by, by 40%. Okay, so for every, um, uh, let's say, dollar of gold, there's going to be two and a half dollars of notes. Okay, so that means if they um, have two billion in gold, that's going to allow them to, to um, issue five billion dollars in, uh, in, in their notes. Now, the commercial banks, they use the central bank notes under the classical gold standard to back up their commercial bank notes and deposits. 
So if they keep 20% reserves, that, that means if there's $5 billion of central bank notes in their vaults, well, then they can issue $25 billion in checking account money and, and, and in their own private notes. So you have this pyramid, and it can become dangerous, right? Because if everyone who had that $25 billion, or was holding that $25 billion, came to demand their, their money back, what would happen? The banks would have to then um, go to the central bank, with their, their, their reserve, with their um, central bank notes, and demand gold. But there's only two billion ultimately backing up 25 billion. So that was a problem with the classical gold standard. And that's why the, 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 the central bank and the private banks are very, very careful about increasing the money supply, okay? Because once they began to lose gold to foreign countries, then American citizens became nervous, and they would begin to go to their banks and pull gold out. That's called an internal drain. Okay, the external drain is the balance of payments deficit, and at that point, um, other people would become nervous because they would see more gold leaving the vaults, and it could be a bank run. And, there was, and that did, did occur under the gold standard. But it was a good thing because it, it taught them a lesson and it caused them to be more prudent and responsible. Okay. Now, uh, let's see, what, what if they increase, you can see here, um, if they lower the reserve ratio of the central bank and issue another... One, they don't have any more gold, but they issue another one billion dollars of notes. Well, then that will get into the the, the uh, system here. That extra billion, the banks can can now issue five billion dollars more. That increases the money supply in the U.S. Okay, um, and let's say we have the Fed at this point. Um, that increases the money supply in the U.S. to thirty billion. And what does that do? Prices go up. We have the whole price specie flow mechanism. We begin to our prices look higher than or are higher than the world prices and we begin to lose gold to the rest of the world because of a balance of payments deficit. So you get an expansion, an unhealthy expansion of this pyramid of money, and it could tip over, okay, if it gets too big at, top, at the top, because people begin to worry. So let's say um, you have a $1 billion deficit. Well, one, the central bank loses $1 billion of gold, and they begin to worry, and people begin to worry, and that's when they stop increasing the money supply, or they actually begin to deflate the money supply, okay? So even though the classical gold system standard was not a perfect monetary system, it had mechanisms that um, restrained inflation by the central banks or by the banking system itself. So the end came in, uh, began in 1914. It ended by 1933 in the United States. And what's interesting to note is some people say the classical gold standard was unstable and collapsed in the 1930s. No, it well, didn't collapse. It was, it was, as Mises pointed out, it was destroyed by deliberate government policies in which they tried to loosen these golden handcuffs and, and so, so that they could inflate to pay for wars or to, to pay to get us out of depressions and so on. So um, during World War I, gold reserves, so there was a first step that was taken. They were centralized in the Fed. The banks were no longer permitted to hold their own reserves. They would have to, instead of the reserves, they would hold the Federal Reserve notes as backup, okay? Though if people demanded gold, they would then turn those reserves in to the central bank, to, to the Fed, and, and, and get the gold. Uh, a heavy tax was placed on the private issue of bank notes. Um, 10%, so that only a few banks would issue notes, so there wasn't much, much competition in private issue of notes. By the mid-1920s, the private issue of bank notes was eliminated. It was declared illegal, okay? Um, and in 1917, we, we prohibited the export of gold, which is a way of interfering with the price specie flow mechanism. But that only occurred for about one year during World War I. And then also, to pay for World War I, the Fed cut reserve requirements in half. So before, banks had to hold about 20% of their notes and checking deposits in the form of gold. Um, it, was, it was cut to about 10%. What happened? The money supply doubled between 1913 and 1919. We had a huge inflation, post-war inflation. And then we had a crash. It was a very deep crash, but it didn't last long because the government didn't interfere. It was, it was called at the time the Depression of 1920-21, okay? But at least the government did not attempt to um, cure the depression, okay? So the, the cure is, 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 is like um, trying to cure um, a, a, a heroin addict, let's say, by giving him more heroin, okay? Because as he starts to, because what a recession is, is going cold turkey, 
okay? Inflation is like um, a, a drug that you become addicted to. In order to stop, in order to be healthy, you have to stop it, and you have to stop it immediately. But if you stop it immediately, you get signs of, of a recession, okay, or a depression like in 2021. And there's a lot of pain. But if you try to stop the pain by giving the guy more heroin, it just postpones the pain. It doesn't cure the victim. Okay, so there were other things that led to the destruction of the classical gold standard. Um, the bank, exp Fed expanded reserves during the 1920s. It, it wanted to help Britain, which w had very high price level after World War I. It wanted to help Britain to, to return to the gold standard. So remember, if Britain's prices, which were 10% higher than the rest of the world, if it has very high prices, it can't sell its gold, it can't sell its coal and other um, products. It's a price specie flow mechanism. So Britain's losing gold to the United States and, and elsewhere. How do you prevent Britain from losing gold? You inflate yourself so you push your prices up as high as, as Britain's prices so that they get a balance of payments uh, that, that is balanced, okay? So we were trying to help Britain, and in doing that, we, we set off inflationary booms in our stock market, in real estate markets, which ultimately led to the Great Depression, okay? Um, we wound up with, with the Great Crash, and then the Great Depression set in, and by 1930, we had many banks failing between 1931 and 1933. And uh, by, uh, on May 1st, 1933, FDR issued an executive order. It wasn't even an act of Congress that ended the gold standard, okay? You were also prohibited from owning gold. American citizens could no longer own gold. And gold was devalued. That means a dollar was, na uh, I'm sorry, the dollar was devalued, which means that a dollar was no longer defined as 1 20th of an ounce of gold. It was now shrunk to 1 35th of an ounce of gold. Okay. So here's the order, and it says, On or before May 1st, 1933, all gold coin, gold bill, bullion, bars, and gold certificates now owned by them, uh, now owned by them uh, to a Federal Reserve Bank, a branch or agency, um, or to any member bank of the Federal Reserve System. And at the bottom it says criminal, criminal penalties for violation of executive order, $10,000 fine or 10 years imprisonment or both as provided in section nine of this ridiculous, monstrous, despotic order, okay? So, that, so that's how the gold standard was destroyed, by raw government power. Okay, so the 1930s was a period of monetary chaos. All countries had their own fiat currencies at this point. They had all gone on the, off the gold standard. Britain went off in 31, U.S. 33. Um, the Latin Union, which was France, Switzerland, a number of other countries went off in 30. They tried to hold out heroically, but they went off in 1936. So what happened was, um, there was, when it was clear that the Allies were going to win the war, there began to be planning for a new world monetary system because of all these currency wars during the 1930s between different countries. Each country had tried to devalue their, their money more to make their goods cheaper. But of course, then other countries wouldn't, wouldn't sit still. They would print their money like crazy to make its value go down to make their goods cheaper, okay, on foreign markets. So the Bretton Woods system was what came out of, of these deliberations, which began in 1943, okay, and uh, was put together in 1944 as a plan. Um, the main architects were the U.S. and British governments, and there was a lot of tension between the two, but the American government came out victorious. The U.S. government wanted the dollar to be the dominant currency in the post-war world, okay? So, oh, let me go back. Um, Harry Dexter White was the U.S. financial expert that represented the U.S. government at Bretton Woods and John Maynard Keynes, the father of macroeconomics and of, of modern depressions and financial crises, um, was the uh, British representative. That's Bretton Woods, okay? They didn't just go to a regular little convention center. I mean, these guys, you know, they all were living it up in this posh setting uh, in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. It's still standing. I, I visited it last, last year. It still operates. It's a beautiful hotel. Um, there's a monster Keynes, and there is the communist Harry Dexter White, which we'll see that he was, it turns out, the Soviet spy. Um, <laughs> after the Venona files were released by the Soviet government in the 1980s, it turned out that 
Uh, in fact, he was suspected to be a, a Soviet spy, and it turned out he was. Um, so uh, he uh, testified and defended his record to the House Un-American Activities Committee. But uh, historians now agree that he passed secret information to the Soviet Union during World War II. Um, uh, he died three or six days after, after his testimony. I'll refrain from saying un something uncharitable about that. Um, Ben Stiles has written a good book on this, uh, came out uh, in 2013 or 2012, says that White acted out, out of idealism, not as a member of the Communist Party. Now, he never did join the American Communist Party, um, not simply because he believed that the Soviet Union was a vital U.S. ally, but because he also believed passionately in the success of the bold Soviet experiment with socialism. So whenever you have a lot of murder and bloodshed and killing by government, it's called, well, it's a bold experiment, right? They never say it's good or successful, it's bold. They took a bold step, okay? So I, I wouldn't put it that way if I were Stiles. But he, as he points out, White was not a Communist Party member because he would not take orders from Moscow. He'd take their money for the, sec for the secrets he sold them, but he wouldn't take uh, orders, okay? He worked on his own terms, okay? Um, and everyone said he wasn't really a bright guy, but he was a hard worker, and... Um, he sort of knew the nuts and bolts of the monetary system. You, you, you have to give him that credit. So what, how did this system operate, or what was it? Um, here were the key characteristics. The US dollar was, was, was denominated or was, was given the role of a key current, of the key currency, okay? It, it was the only currency under the Bretton Woods system that was directly convertible into gold at the devalued rate of $35 per ounce, okay? But, you or, and I or, or our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents couldn't get gold for their dollars. They couldn't convert their dollars into gold, okay? The only people that could convert, uh, or agencies that could, could convert dollars into gold were foreign official institutions, central banks and governments, okay? U.S. citizens could not convert my, uh, their dollars into gold and still were not even permitted to own gold under penalty of law. U.S. citizens were not permitted to own gold until 1976. Okay. Um, if you were a licensed jeweler or licensed dentist, you could get you could get gold only for those purposes uh, of uh, that, you, that you know related to your work. Okay. If you were found taking the gold, selling it to someone else, then you would be prosecuted. You couldn't even I found out you couldn't even own gold in Canada. In other words, you couldn't hold, own and hold gold outside the U.S. Okay, now what about the other cu currencies like the pound and the, uh, the German mark and so on? Okay, they were not the key currencies um, and they were backed by dollars. So they held dollars instead of gold, okay, to back up their currencies. Now, that is a very um, pernicious system, as we'll see. Okay, it's a system that's self contradictory and that will lead to its own collapse. If the dollar is treated as good as gold, then people, if the U.S. government has deficits, foreign countries will never send the dollars back for gold if they believe that, that the dollar is as good as gold. And they did for a while, but after a while they'd lost confidence, fortunately. Um, so under the principles of operation were as follows. Foreign currencies were, ex were expanded and pyramided on top of dollars and ultimately the U.S. gold stock. So in other words, if the U.S. had balance of payments deficits, People, the exporters in foreign countries who sold us stuff took these dollars, they didn't want the dollars, they went to their central banks and they demanded their own currencies. So let's say you were a French exporter, you earned dollars, you went to the central bank, you turned in the dollars. Where did the central bank get the francs to pay you? Created it out of thin air. So U.S. inflation was exported to foreign countries. They gave us real goods, we gave them paper dollars. Okay, and I'll show you this in a little bit more detail. So the balance of payments mechanism didn't work under the Bretton Woods system, and that was the key. Here, if the U.S. now increased the money supply, U.S. prices would go up above world prices, our exports would go down, we'd get a lot of imports from foreign countries, we'd have a balance of payments deficit, but guess what? Here's the key. Gold wouldn't flow out of the country, dollars would. And when these dollars flowed to other countries, their central banks bought them, and they bought them by printing their own money. So we caused world inflation. This system caused world inflation. And the U.S. Um, had strong reasons to be inflationary, okay? Um, and by the way, here's the pyramid. Now, now you have 
gold in the, at, at the Fed, uh, the Fed notes and deposits, bank deposit, banks deposit their reserves at the Fed, and the Fed issued notes, which we all carry in our wallets. Um, those backed up the commercial bank deposits, but now what was backing up foreign currencies? What was backing up foreign currencies were bank deposits in U.S. banks, okay? Which that when they got, they usually sold for U.S. government securities. So now you had a, a huge and very unstable pyramid that was all based on the U.S. gold stock. So one French economist pointed out that the U.S. could run deficits without tears, that is, without any, any bad consequences. So um, we ran, from 1958 onward, we ran continual balance of payments deficits because we were just giving them our paper. We were printing our paper, giving them our paper, and they were giving us real goods and services. We were, we, were, we were getting cheap foreign imports. Um, as long as the foreign governments and central banks were willing to accept and hold our dollars, we didn't have to worry about deficits. And Jacques Rueff was the, the French economist who used that term, and he was also an advisor to the president of France, Charles de Gaulle, who um, did not like the fact that the U.S. dollar was dominant and that the U.S. dominated the Western world, so-called. So what happened? U.S. prices continued to go up um, so that one gold ounce could buy foreign currencies that purchased more goods than the $35 did, which what you could get for, for, for the dollar. So what happened is people began to sell gold. Now, Europeans were allowed to own gold. They were be I'm sorry, they began to sell their dollars. So they, they would sell their dollars for, for gold, for gold uh, in, in London and Zurich, and that would push the price of gold up to $38 to $40. But the U.S., had to keep the price of gold at $35. So it would have to send gold out of the country to foreign governments that would then sell gold in these markets to, push, to keep the price at $35. So we began to hemorrhage gold, okay? Um, so it paid to buy foreign currencies and use them to buy gold. Uh, let me explain why, it's something called arbitrage. Um, if you had $35, you would go to these foreign free gold markets, buy an ounce of gold, you would get, let's say, 70 German marks because the exchange rate was two marks to one dollar. But since there was no inflation in Germany, you could buy more goods in Germany with 70 Deutsch marks than you could buy in the U.S. with 35 dollars. So guess what? You would take the 70 German marks, you'd buy all these goods in Germany, you'd export them to the U.S. where you could get 40 dollars for them. So you turn 35 dollars into 40 dollars, okay? Because U.S. prices were higher, all right? So the U.S. had to continually sell gold because everyone was trying to get, was selling dollars to get gold in these free markets. Eventually, we had, we had the Vietnam War beginning. Um, we, w President Johnson promised that we would have guns and butter, that even though we had to pay all this money for, uh, uh, for, toward def defense uh, for fighting in Vietnam, we would not be taxed, they would not raise taxes to pay for the war, okay? So we would have butter too. Guns and butter was, was the motto of the Johnson administration. So what happened? We forced, in a way, the dominance of the dollar caused Europeans to pay for our war. U.S. living standards didn't go down during the war, which they usually do during wars. Why? Because we were just paying dollars that were going out through our balance of payments. We were buying more imports than we were selling to them. So we'd get real goods and services. Consumer prices would, wouldn't rise as much and they would get dollars that were decreasing in value, okay? Eventually, they got fed up, okay? Especially France and Germany. Uh, Germany was still an, it was an occupied country, there was still U.S. troops, so Germany couldn't do too much about it, but they wanted to now turn their dollars back in, they wanted gold themselves. France pulled out of NATO, because the U.S. blackmailed France and Germany and said, you know, um, okay, we'll give you your gold back for your dollars, but the problem is, of course, then we won't be able to afford to keep uh, our nuclear defense uh, against the Russians. So we blackmailed them. And um, so f uh, France thumbed their noses at us. They dropped out of NATO. They built up their own nuclear uh, defense force. And they demanded gold. And the U.S. Gave them, gave them the gold. And the French didn't just send, like, freighters to get their gold. They sent a warship. They didn't trust that there wouldn't be some sort of an accident on the way back with that gold. Um, and so they got, they got the gold out. And that was Jacques Rueff, who was a friend of Mises, advising Charles de Gaulle, the president, who um, was behind all of that, which was, was a great thing to embarrass the U.S. like that. 
Um, yeah, so th th for that period when France was out of NATO, it was because the U.S. had blackmailed them, basically. Okay. And here's what happened to the gold stock. We had more than half the gold in the world. This is at $35 per ounce. Okay, there was $25 billion in the U.S. gold stock. Um, the rest of the world had uh, dollar liabilities of only $12 billion. So at that point, foreigners were convinced that, look, there's more than enough gold to pay off all dollars that we're holding, so the dollar's as good as gold. Okay? And, and since U.S. citizens couldn't demand gold, well, then all that gold was more than enough to cover the foreign liabilities. Uh, and then, because of what, what I explained to you, uh, we began to get a fall in the gold stock. Okay? By 1967, there was $12 billion in, in our gold stock and $50 billion of foreign liabilities. That's when they started getting very nervous and demanding their gold back. Um, in 68, we were down to 10, uh, and by 71, there were $9 billion in the gold stock, and there was a run on the dollar, okay? The, the foreign governments were demanding gold so that they could keep the, the price of gold down, um, uh, and uh, it's, there, it was said that there was, we had about two weeks left of, of gold. It would have all run out, uh, and there was $80 billion of foreign liabilities. Um, by 1968, they stopped worrying about what was happening in the free gold markets. They allowed the price to go up. Um, the U.S. demanded that only central banks buy and sell gold to one another at the fake price of $35, even though in the, in the free gold markets it was selling for $38 or sometimes it would go up to $40. And finally, um, uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon, you've got to know there's something wrong with the guy with a middle name at Milhouse, um, <laughs> closed the gold window, okay? So he said, I have directed Secretary, you've got to find this video on, online, it's online, it looks, he looks ridiculous. Uh, I, I've directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily, yeah, that means forever, the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of the monetary stability and the best interests of the United States. Well, that's, of course, what he was saying. So the U.S. reneged on a solemn pledge that it made in 1944 when it formulated this Bretton Woods system. So it reneged on its own system, okay? Uh, we then went back to a, uh, a system for about 13 months. Uh, it was called the Smithsonian system. It was a monetary system where there was no gold involved, but there were still fixed exchange rates. Nixon called it the greatest monetary agreement in world history. It collapsed 13 months later. Okay. Um, all right. So now here we are today. We've had the financial crisis, the Great Recession. We've had a very slow recovery. And people are starting to look around for alternative monetary arrangements quantitative easing, uh, forward guidance of interest rates, all this nonsense that the Fed is, has been spouting for, uh, since 2008. None of this stuff has worked. So understandably, there are some people that want the return, restoration of a gold standard. So there's a recent proposal that uh, wants the Fed to target the price of gold, okay? And it's the basis of this bill. The Dollar Bill Act of 2013, introduced by Representative Ted Poe of Texas, okay? It's a totally phony gold standard, as I'll show you. Worse than Bretton Woods. Okay, so the, the Fed would fix the price of gold within a narrow band, within plus um, or, or, or minus 2% of the target price. Um, how would you get the target price? Well, you have the Board of Governors um, designated some target week, 90 days from, between 90 days and 120 days from now. And of course, this is conceived in secrecy, so you know there's a problem here. Using a random process, some computer random process on a computer, the board would designate a special week and a target moment, and they wouldn't publicly disclose it. At that moment, what they would do was they would find what the price of gold is on the commodities exchange standard, um, a commodities exchange um, uh, market, and uh, at that moment, it would fix the price of gold. That would be the, the, the price of gold in terms of dollars. The Fed would have to maintain that price, okay? Plus or minus 2%. Um, they would do it by open market operations, buying and selling government bonds, okay? And it would be barred, they, they would not be allowed to use indirect methods. They couldn't target the Fed funds rate like they do now. Well, I mean, so what? I mean, they're still using, able to, to use open market operations. Um, gold would play no role, really, in all of this, okay? The dollar would still be a pure fiat money, controlled by the Fed. The monetary base would still be, con be what it is today, meaning the, the monetary base is what the Fed directly controls. 
It would be the amount of Fed notes held by the public that you and I have in our wallets and purses, um, the amount of, of reserves that banks have in their banks and ATM, uh, in their vaults and ATM machines, plus the reserves held by the banks uh, on deposit at the Fed. That's exactly what the monetary base is today. So it doesn't change it. It doesn't make gold the ultimate money. It's still these fake reserves or, 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 or reserves that can be printed out of thin air, okay? Just with one, one stroke, one keystroke, okay? And that exists in, in cyberspace. Uh, the Fed would still control the monetary base, okay. Um, so, so suppose it was established at $1,300 per ounce. Um, the Fed would be legally compelled to uh, um, conduct open market sales, okay, when the, monetary, when the price of gold rose above 2% over 1300 That's $1,326. So in other words, if the price of gold went to that limit, the Fed would then have to sell bonds and reduce the amount of money in the economy, okay, to keep it in that limit. On the other hand, if it went below $1,274, means they, they, to avoid deflation, they would have to then buy bonds and print new money, okay? Okay, where, where is gold in all of this? Okay, it's just the, this price of gold that they fixed. Okay, so the main problem is um, it's, a, it's a gold standard in name only. In fact, the supporters call it the goldless gold standard. They think it's a great thing. Um, there will be no gold dollar coins gold dollars coined uh, or in circulation, okay? The Fed would not be required to maintain convertibility between dollars and gold or to hold any gold reserves at all. At least under Bretton Woods, they were forced to hold gold reserves and they had to convert them at least for foreign governments. That would be gone now. Um, so this POSE, Pose Act would leave the fiat dollar fully intact and the supply of dollar would, dollars would still be subject to the Fed, okay? And of course, if you went into a recession or if you had an emergency in the Middle East and you had to intervene, what would they do? They would suspend th th that. I mean, you know, it's just a matter of saying, well, now, now the price of gold can go to 1400 so we can inflate more. Okay, they wouldn't say that, but they, they would change the price of gold. It's a sim you know, simple stroke of the pen. Um, it's the same old Fed monopoly, okay? Uh, what I want to get to in, uh, before I end is, is the supporters. The supporters are, you know, very famous supply siders. Uh, uh, Steve Forbes has written a, a book that's just come out on, on this type of a gold standard. Uh, there's an economic journalist named Lewis Woodhill. And then uh, Nathan Lewis has written two books on the gold standard. Um, I think he calls it Gold, the Monetary Polaris. It's one, one book uh, that's very interesting and shows what they really want. They all, all of them recognize that fiat currency would be, uh, the dollar would be a fiat currency and it would be controlled by the Fed, okay? But here's some of the interesting things they say. Um, they still believe that the gold standard, even in history, was an invention of government, that it didn't come, uh, uh, that it didn't arise or evolve on the market, okay? So Forbes himself says, well, there's countless varieties of gold standards. Yes, Steve, but there's only one real gold standard. And he says the common characteristic is the following. And listen, he says, theoretically, you don't need an ounce of yellow metal to operate a gold standard. So you, can have a, you don't need any gold to operate a gold standard. All you need is to refer to the price in the open market. Okay? He said, who ever heard of such a thing? That, why, that, why call it a gold standard then? Okay? Uh, Nathan Lewis, who wrote two, has written two books on this, um, he says that all of these systems, even a 100% gold standard was an invention of government. That's just bad history. Okay? It's not true. Um, he calls it the no gold gold standard. That's his favorite term, in which the money manager does not buy or sell gold, but instead targets the gold price by buying or selling bonds. And he even says they could even buy fine art. It doesn't matter what they buy or sell, as long as they're producing dollars um, when, 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 when the, 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 the price of, of gold is falling. And the big thing is they say, well, gold is a completely fixed in value. It has an intrinsically fixed value. What does that even mean? Okay. So Lewis says uh, gold standards can be used as a measuring rod <clears throat> to keep the value of money stable. Um, and he says it keeps its intrinsic value better than anything on the planet. Well, we know as Austrians, all value is subjective. The reason why people value gold is for using it directly or because it provides them with a good money. Okay. There's no, no good has an intrinsic value. And they don't define it. Woodhill says, Woodhill says something like the same. Um, the most fundamental thing about a unit of measurement is that it be constant. 
Gold is not money, and it should not be money. However, we can and should use gold to define the value of the dollar. So what he's saying is that gold isn't money. It's some kind of a measuring rod. And you'll see something weird here. Um, when Forbes says, uh, he, he compares gold to a foot, the value of gold to a foot that has 12 inches that doesn't change, or um, a pound that has 16 ounces that doesn't restrict your weight. Um, so those things are completely fixed. And he's claiming the value of gold is the same. Is the same. That's, that's totally ridiculous, okay? Gold goes up and down in value. Um, and see, the key is they want the room to have inflation. So he says, uh, the virtue of a properly constructed gold standard is that it's both stable and flexible. It's stable in value and flexible in meeting the marketplace's natural need for money. So he's worried if the economy is growing rapidly, as it did under the gold standard, he doesn't want prices to fall. He's afraid it's going to lead to a depression. So he says such a gold-based system would allow for rapid expansion of the money supply. Rapid expansion of the money supply. So their motto is, we want sound money but, and plenty of it. Okay, which is totally you know, self-contradiction. And then Lewis takes it to its uh, um, logical and, and ridiculous conclusion. He says, you know, if gold is intrinsically constant uh, in value, then we can find out what's happening to people's real incomes by stating it in terms of gold. And so what he does is this. Um, he starts in 1955, goes to 2010. Notice what he does. He does. This is the median male full-time income in gold ounces. So he's telling us that people were richer in 1965 or so than they are in 2010. And even in 55, they're richer than they were in 2010. Okay? Because, because their income can buy more gold ounces. Did you ever think of the fact that gold was worth, uh, the price of gold was $35 here? And it, it's, you know, it got up to, uh, you know, $1,800, and now what is it, $1,300 or so? Okay? So the value of gold is changing, and so he uses it to make the following claim. Um, so here's the real income in gold ounces. It went from 125 ounces per year to 250 in 1970, so people were getting richer. Getting their income was going up, and suddenly it collapsed. That's when gold prices went up the first time um, in, uh, to 25 ounces. Went up to 150, and then when the gold price rose, it collapsed again. So, according to Lewis, real income in 2010 was only 14 percent of what it was in 1970, and 28% percent of what it was in, in, in 2001. Um, so he's telling us that we're maybe only one one fifth as rich as or less than one fifth as rich as we as we were. Our incomes, our economy is one-fifth the size of, uh, because the gold prices have changed. Okay, so that's just nutty. That's not the way to defend a gold standard. Okay, so summing up, it's not a gold standard. doesn't restrain the Fed from uh, increasing the money supply. In fact, it gives it a window to increase the money supply, okay, when, when, the, gold price, uh, when the gold price falls, okay. Um, so imagine when the gold price going from 1800 to 1300 as it did, he would have tremendous increase in the money supply to push it back up to what it was a few years ago, $1,800. And it would collapse even more quickly than the Bretton Woods system collapsed. Okay. And uh, thank you for your attention.